Enter the crib. Your strike back sit rep starts in three, two, one. Wait, do we go on zero? like the picture of like the three of them as my background on my computer and I'm just like oh god damn it Mac um all right <clears throat> welcome all right. back me first <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're a blooper roll oh my god okay <clears throat> I think that is our introduction for this right there girls <laughs> let's just move on okay all right all right fine Episode 7, here yep. we go. Episode 7. I'm Kelsey. And I'm Deb. Uh, and yeah, we're yeah. still crying. Yeah, yeah, we're still crying. Um, <laughs> God, uh, I'm sorry you guys are probably tired of us crying about episode 6, considering we've done it in a review and our interviews and our chat with Dan, and now it's episode 7 and we're still crying. Uh, but yeah, so episode 7, spoilers, blah, 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 you know the deal. We're going to do our review. You hear behind-the-scenes fact from Jack Lothian. And then uh, Dan McPherson stops by, as usual, both for Blame Wyatt, and you get your actual interview with Dan McPherson today, and mm -hmm. as well as uh, military advisor Paul Bittis. So we have both of those for you, another chock full episode. Um, just so you guys know, we actually have two interviews, an episode for, yeah, for the whole entire yeah, last half of the yep. season. Everybody want, wanted the back half of the season. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you're going to have some uh, extra stuff going on each sit rep, which is great. Uh, it's been very exciting to get to talk to everybody. And we have stuff planned for postseason as well that I think is a secret, but it's going to be really fun, too. So, episode seven, Deb. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I, I really didn't know what to expect. I was sort of hoping that this would be like a lot of episodes post major character death that we just sort of like pay a little attention and then we move on and, and we so didn't get this from this and i just i'm so tired of crying and i'm still crying and it was a really good episode we got a lot of information and yet we're still up in the air as to kind of what's going on you know Demachi has stepped up and is now a much more focus of what's going on and maybe we obviously see her what her plan was which was wild hello but i'm watching these episodes and every time they every time there there's an engagement i'm like looking away because i'm just waiting all i can think is there's four episodes left who else is gonna die so every time the bullets fly <laughs> i'm not wanting to watch the screen because I'm so afraid someone's going to get it. And every time someone goes off on their own, I'm like, no, 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 no. Stay together. Stay together. You're going to get shot. And of course, why it did. Thank God it, it, you know, he took it in the best. But yeah. oh, there's you know, like, what the hell is Sir James doing there? It, this was just all over the place. And so, ugh. What the hell is going on? I'm not happy that Sir James is there. I'm so glad that it was written that he's a liability because that was my first thought is, what is he doing there? He's a liability. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, so I thought it was great. I really thought it felt like a season one strike back episode in that like everybody's there's a huge team they have all this backup everybody's in uniform there's like an actual briefing it's super <laughs> professional <laughs> we haven't seen professional in like six seasons yeah uh, so so that was kind of amazing uh, I don't know if you guys caught it but if you didn't yeah. go back and watch straight from the helicopter uh sitting next to James is none of the mil none other than military advisor Paul Bittis he's also in the briefing room 
um, which is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, he's right from right in the start of the episode. He's he's in all those scenes. Yeah, yeah. So so that is super cool. Um, also, the other thing I thought was really fun uh, when you guys see the van and and that Wyatt is driving the one that he then drives off of a cliff. But when he pulls up with Lynn and they get Coltrane. For those of you who follow Alin on Instagram, and if you're not, you should be, uh, you might be in the cup holder because Alin did a little <laughs> like Insta Live the day they were filming that. And uh, when I saw that and the get in boss, I was like, hey, wait, we're there. We're in a scene. <laughs> we're on her phone sitting in her cup holder. So that was um, so that was pretty fun. But yeah, it was great. I mean, there were some really, yeah, they're, they're not going to just skim over over losing Mac. <laughs> Uh, which is really good. Is I mean, um, it's hard that it's having such an emotional impact, but it's also great that they're showing how real this is, you know? Moving on is, is tough, so... Oh, poor Chetri. I feel so bad for Chetri. Yeah, oh. she... There's a lot I feel bad for. <laughs> they all feel responsible, as you all heard Dan talk about last week uh, when we... <laughs> couldn't blame it on Wyatt uh, and he said they all blame themselves so Deb your favorite fight by the night I I really didn't have one I I could choose I I really um, for the same reasons I liked the whole engagement right in the beginning you know that they they had a, a team to to back them up and um, that it just yeah it my first thought when the episode started was, what? A ghillie suit. We haven't seen a ghillie suit in ever, I think, on this show. And so it was like the message right from the start that this is going to be a little bit different in terms of the engagement here. And so I really enjoyed that. I was I was so nervous the whole time. I think probably one of my favorite shots of the whole episode was when they had the mafia dude in the old airport area there. Yeah. And pulled him back into the hangar um, after Mac makes his presence known. And he's like looking around for a way to get out. And then Chetri pops up yeah. and has a gun on him. And the look on his face is like, yeah. <laughs> I just, I liked seeing her being engaged at that level. That was, you know, that was cool. Did you say after Mac makes his presence known? Oh my God. I said, oh no. Oh. <laughs> Bravo one. Bravo. <laughs> Oh, I, know. Oh, I can't even accept him as bro. I know, right? <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, so I, I, we're just gonna move on from that because we're yeah. all gonna cry. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, the, I like the helicopter uh, assault just because I love a good helicopter scene. There's just nothing like the the t the like intensity of the rotors and the everything like coming in. It's just super cool. So, I, I, we're just going to move on. <laughs> Emotional moment of the night. <laughs> God damn it, Mac. <sighs> it really was, like, how do you choose? Oh, I say that every week, but how do you choose? I mean, the, I, the stuff in the, <laughs> in the truck, I like that they were trying to have, you know, some funny memories. Yeah. But it's still just... Just all the tension between Wyatt and Novin is yeah. just hard um, in poor Chetri. But I think how really hard this is hitting Coltrane is mostly what I, what I took away from this. And how, I mean, he's just scrutinizing them. He's always been, you know, watching them and taking in what he can. But the way he's just... You know, he, I mean, he's like boring holes into each of trying to get a read on where they're at. But, I mean, he's so devastated that he can barely help, too. You know, there's just, they're falling apart over this. Oh, how was, you know, I'm, I'm nervous because they all have different points of view and he's trying to rein it in. And I don't know if he's going to be successful in that. And then, you know, the one person he's looking to for help what the hell is he doing there? He's got yeah. him on it. You know, it, that's throwing Coltrane off right there because that doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, I can't pick one moment. I think just the whole, the, the tension underlying the entire team right now. So for me, it was Wyatt and Novin in the beginning because 
when he went, when she's like furious with him, and he went cold, and the, I apologize for my miscommunication, Lance Corporal, literally the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Like, it just was like, like my body felt tense, and I was like, oh my god, like the, Dan just went to like a different place of like, cold rage that we just haven't seen in Wyatt and it just and of course when he's like do you really want to talk about it or whatever and Novin and and Alin just grits back those tears and I was like oh. <laughs> but yeah I mean then I like that was my mo but of course possible is like Coltrane talking to James or you know Wyatt and Novin at the end um before they get trapped um when they're scoping out the place but but that one for me just because the sheer like physical reaction that i had to wyatt's i'm sorry for the miscommunication lance corporal was just like like it's just that like where your back goes tense and you're like oh, what's gonna happen um, yeah <laughs> well and i i think there was also something what was it that that James, Sir James said to, to Coltrane, you know, you're taking this too personally. And he's like, look, it's like, Coltrane's like, it's like I drove him to his death, you know? Oh my God. I mean, the level of guilt that they all feel is just overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. What was your, uh, what the fuck moment for the episode? Uh, I, meh. I, there were good ones in this. I mean, Damachi wiping out all the families was kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but it's probably going to be the kill box at the end. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that was... After yeah. last week to leave us on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is why I'm like, I can't... I, I literally am like putting my hand up in front of the screen because if someone gets their head blown off, I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so when the kill box came up and... Again, reference to previous, ep you know, previous seasons that yeah. Scott and Stonebr Stonebridge got caught in a kill box. You know, it's just like there's all these little things and yeah. little lines of dialogue that Jack is using. You know, the soldiers will come for you. Yeah. Um, you know, there's I love that he's doing all these little brilliant references back to other seasons. Yeah. But the, I could have done without the kill box. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that was, that, my what the fuck was just, we had, episode five, we ended on this cliffhanger of watching Mac bleed out. Then we have to watch Mac die. And then the next episode is this cliffhanger again of a kill box. And I'm just going like, when do we get to breathe? <laughs> Apparently, you, not for, for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. I did like Zaya cracking a couple jokes <laughs> that was unexpected <laughs> or maybe i just like guns yeah <laughs> so there were you know there were a couple of laughs in this but... sure yes there were a couple of laughs in this yeah. uh but um yeah i mean i also laughed i thought current the coltrane's like you're not a terrible driver a terrible <laughs> driver would have taken us all the way over the edge which i thought was brilliant I really like that. I loved Jamie's delivery of that was really great. Yeah. Um, that was super cute. Like a little, that was funny. So. What? It was a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> it was a compliment. <laughs> All right. Predictions. Predictions for. <laughs> I predict. <Pain. laughs> that we're probably not done crying. That's my prediction. <laughs> okay. Okay. That goes along with mine, which was pain. 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 Never-ending pain. Yeah, no, I, that's all I got is pain. Yeah, sorry we're not very uh, useful to you guys this week. Uh, I think, honestly, we are still reeling from episode six. And you guys need to Multiple understand times. we've watched episode six probably six or seven times over weeks. And... <laughs> and it does not get easier so good luck with your rewatches <laughs> no it wasn't and and just so y'all know we do try to be really careful with our spoilers we take copious notes the first time we watch things so that we only tell you guys our thoughts from the episode when we watched it the first time so don't ever think we're teasing things that we know are coming yeah uh 
but God, keeping that one it was, secret it was, was terrible. It was really hard to see how excited you guys were about what was going on with Mac and knowing what was coming. It was, that was hard. So uh, anyways, you're going to hear your behind the scenes facts from Jack Lothian Woo! next. And then uh, you'll hear from Dan McPherson on why it wasn't Wyatt's fault. And then you're going to hear Paul Bittis' interview and then hear from Dan McPherson again because more Dan is always the answer. <laughs> We've got Overwatch. Jack's facts coming in. All right, Mavers, welcome back to Jack's Facts for Episode 7. Episode 7 and 8 welcome John Strickland to the Strike Back family. John's an Emmy award-winning director who has directed shows like Bodyguard, Prime Suspect, and X Company. And he's also the perfect English gentleman who was very polite about the fact that the scripts were so late. <laughs> okay. In the attack on the compound at the start, the first soldier out of the helicopter is none other than military advisor Paul Biddis. In many ways, if it wasn't for Biddis being there, backing up Section 20, it's quite possible the team may not have survived, making Biddis the unsung hero of the episode. We love Biddis. We do. Spencer originally waved away Coltrane's concerns over his wounds with the line, I've had worse at Easter Road on a Saturday. But the networks felt the reference was a bit too obscure, <laughs> as if international audience wouldn't know that Easter Road is the home of Edinburgh Football Club Hibs. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> it's possibly a few Americans may not have gotten it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, when the team approached the cabin, the song playing is Sedefi Maika Budase, <laughs> or something similar. <laughs> I'm sorry, Croatia. By the singer Silvana Armanulic. Silvana was a huge star in oh sorry, Yugoslavia. <laughs> Silvana was a huge star in Yugoslavia. Oh my god. But as she became older, she became obsessed with her own death and in nineteen seventy six she met with the famous blind mystic Baba Vanga to have her fortune told. Baba Vanga refused to tell her fortune turning away from Silvana and telling her to return in three months if she was able. <laughs> oh Silvana took it as a premonition of her death, and tragically, she died in a car crash a few months later. That's crazy. That's <laughs> Okay. The airplane graveyard the team had the shootout in was a real a airplane graveyard right next to the hangar and runway where we filmed the private jet. Originally, the shootout was meant to be set somewhere else, but once we saw the airplane graveyard, we knew it was a location for us. It's a super cool location. Yeah, very cool. Why a speech about Mac's death, if they'd just arrived sooner, driven faster, came from a conversation with Dan about how he saw Mac's death. Originally, there was a different speech in the script, but it's one of those occasions when an actor has a better insight into their character and how they might be feeling. Oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jack Smack. <laughs> was the original speech, Mac didn't die? Didn't <laughs> <laughs> we want that speech, Mac. <laughs> We're not at Xville. Stay with us at the crib. All right, guys, we are back with Dan McPherson for episode seven. Uh, I actually considered not doing uh, It's Wyatt's Fault this week until we saw Wyatt drive a car almost halfway off a cliff. Yet again, why Wyatt shouldn't be driving? What the hell, dude? Well, 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 hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's just let's just start let's just start right there. Uh, welcome to the first global lockdown pandemic edition <laughs> of the Sit Back Podcast. Let's blame Wyatt for everything. Uh, our listenership's just gone through the roof uh, as people troll through many many podcasts while they are going uh, crazy in quarantine, like myself. True. Um, you know what doesn't doesn't really like work is when you're a caffeine addict and you're locked down in a small apartment, I've like, I've 
I've worked out every single way to putt a golf ball around <laughs> this apartment <laughs> through my wife's feet and legs past all the furniture. But um, but I gotta say, when I get out of this lockdown, my putting is gonna be badass. <laughs> um, episode seven, Wyatt, as Coltrane says, if it was really Wyatt's fault and if he was a really bad driver, uh, he would have driven him all the way off the cliff, <laughs> and he didn't. And he just, you know, every now and again, you just gotta shake things up. They, they were obviously avoiding talking about Mac. They were not dealing with. Um, their grief, their regret, their anger, all these sort of things that um, they're all bottling up inside. And sometimes you just need to shake it up. And why it did that, just driving them halfway off the cliff, not the full way off the cliff, because that would be stupid. Um, and they managed to get out of there. It was all good. So again, why it saves the day. Um, if Novan hadn't have, if Novan had have been wearing her seatbelt, and not gone careering over to the front of the car, the balance and the weight would have been perfect. So, again, Novan ruining Wyatt's plans, um, but no one mentions that. It's just Wyatt, as usual. But it did give us a little moment just to talk about uh, what was important. You know, it prioritises things when you're in a life-and-death situation. And um, I, I always had it under control, and uh, that's what the fuss <laughs> See what I feel like you missed a really great opportunity to blame us because the moment we saw that van, I went, Wait a second, I recognize that van. We're in the cup holder. <laughs> it could have just been fucking people distracting you. We, we, I got to drive that van over the course of like three or four weeks in Croatia, and we. I think we had four of them, to be fair. I think we had three or four of those same vans because we were using them in different different units and there were stunt versions and, and like, ones that went on hydraulic cranes and things like that as it went over the edge. So that was quite a really – it was quite an in-depth kind of stunt set up there. So you had one van that was on a track built and cut into the side of that cliff, which was which didn't move, and then another one that was lifted by a crane and suspended by a crane that would rock back and forth. Then you had a stunt one that um, the stunty smashed up, and then you had the hero van, and I loved it. Like I had a great time in that thing, and I was thrashing it. But it was also like a little bit temperamental, so it held us up on occasion on set sometimes. But um, I think now the hero one, the back door wouldn't close, so every time Novan had to jump in and slam the back door, it'd bounce back open, and we'd have to pull <laughs> cut a lin, or I'd have to speed off, and a lin was trying to hold the door closed, and with a your gun and and those seat belt and there was I mean look I apologise uh, to health and safety and the insurers for <laughs> revealing this after the fact but um, yeah I was pretty fly by the city of pants out there in Croatia um, in this instance and we all survived on me back to the crib all right guys we are back we are so excited to have our guest you have heard from him before he is not only the military advisor for Strike Back, but star of episode seven. Welcome, Paul Villas. <laughs> <Bittis. laughs> I don't want to say star. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was really cool to see you. I, I was like, I know that guy on that helicopter. Hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that guy in that briefing. I yeah. know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming back and talking to us. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. Yeah. Well, well, one hell of a season so far. Yeah. Can Warren's dead. Max dead. I guess Warren's alive, which is good. <laughs> Last we knew. And, uh, and episode seven is phenomenal. And I was really excited once we saw it, I realized why you wanted to talk about it. One, because you're in it. But, and two, because you get a lot of really cool military shit going on. So... I guess just if can you talk a little bit about the difference filming this season and last season? Um, well, it wasn't hot for starters, like Malaysia. <laughs> so we were sweating my bits off. But no, it's I mean I mean it was yeah, I mean that the season it was like a it was everything like a James Bond this season. You know, like James Bond stunts and, and action and, and everything. And obviously and there's so much more to come that you know, when you when you see it, it's going to blow your blow your mind. You know, so it, it's it's like you know the best for last, I suppose. But everything about this season's been 
you know really ramped up it was you know but you know but for for me like you know, i mean that that operation that 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 first operation that you see i sort of helped completely write that operation for jack because it, you know they had a helicopter and i'm like well if we got one let's do a proper heliborn assault um and i remember jack and new were like would they really do this? Would they really just go straight into a camp like that? And I said, yes. And I, I said, and I gave them an example, which is um, an operation in Sierra Leone, up Barras, where um, a lot of my friends were involved, where they literally dropped straight on so- top of an insurgent camp and started a, a firefight straight on top of them. They had, you know, an overwatch, snipers taking people out just like you saw with with wire and and then the, the teams coming in, in in two waves and and having a, a, a diversion to bring most of the enemy away and obviously i've just gone completely off tangent and talking about this operation because i was so proud of it when it all came together really good so that was the difference between filming in croatia and malaysia <laughs> <laughs> well i it, it really did feel very different from anything we've seen before first of all when it first started i'm like Check it, a ghillie suit. I don't think we've seen one of those on this show. <laughs> like, I hand, I, if you ask, ask um, Dan about it, I hand made that ghillie suit from scratch. Oh, wow. That's so I taught, awesome. like, I, I'm going to put pictures up of it later on. All right. But it's, it was hand, it was handmade and I took the strands, I took, I got like, you know, sort of Hessian and I took one strand at a time. So between doing the advice, then I would sit back behind the camera and watch stuff. And I was sat there with my Hessian, just taking one strand at a time. And my mate, the uh, um, Dan, uh, Dan, um, who's the uh, sorry, Dell, who who's the uh, health and safety advisor, Bombshell Dell, um, who <laughs> without Bombshell Dell, strike back probably wouldn't happen. He's he's he makes things happen in places like strike back films in places that most camera camera crews or most film production units wouldn't even touch with a barge pole because they're so dangerous, but he makes them happen, and he was—you'd be sat there looking at me, going, "You look like an old woman sewing." And I'm like, "Yeah, well, the end result, mate." And obviously, you saw the end result that ghillie suit, which I've, I've still got, and it's going to be used on a, a computer game as well now. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. 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 Hard to believe Dan didn't want to wear that instead <laughs> of his Hawaiian shirts for the rest of his life. <laughs> I think I think Dan wanted to take it as well, but I'm like, no, that's mine. I'm having it. That's my suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's brilliant. It adds. I love like watching Dan run in it, and it did because <laughs> you know, as Wyatt, he's always got the yeah bright shirts or whatever, like so flashy, and it was nice to see him looking like a real soldier. Yeah, it, was, it, it, it makes a change them getting a bit of cam on their face as well, doesn't it? Uh, I know how they don't like putting cam on their face, these actor types, but um, it was nice them having a bit of um, bit of cam on them. But uh, no, it was, and it was how I visioned it as well. And when I was making the suggestion on how to do this heli, heliborn assault, and that obviously White then breaks away from his OP and starts charging towards you know towards the um, the, the encampment just as the helicopter's coming down to land with the, the assault force to, to break out and. When you see it, like, yes, nailed it. You know, it really looked good. Uh, yeah. Well, it really was almost a throwback to Strike Back when it first started. Seeing, like, yeah. an entire team, seeing everybody in uniform, like a full-on, like, professional briefing, <laughs> the helicopter assault, yeah, as yeah. opposed to just, like, a few guys running around in, like, T-shirts. Um, but can you talk more about that? Because I always love helicopter scenes like this i find like it i mean i think one of the iconic ones of course black hawk down where you have all the you know helicopters coming in is just like they're incredible yeah. so can you talk about setting that up and of course then getting to be in the helicopter as it's going um well they, i mean they they had one helicopter from the the croatian military um and and with everything with with the military you, there's so many hurdles that have to be jumped just to just to get into it just to just to look at the thing and and the, the safety aspect you know there's certain things that you can do and you couldn't do so you have to work around around it obviously you know there's going to be edits and you can edit things to make it look like the, the things literally just smashed in on the ground everyone's jumped out and then it's took off 
you know, and you couldn't fire too close to it. In reality, yeah. you'd be firing. And I remember one of the one of the crews, uh, one of the that I mean, every, everyone's army's different, and their doctrine's different. And I remember one of the crews raised a concern that, oh no, we wouldn't do this in operations. We wouldn't be firing. We'd be getting straight out. And and then I, I sat down and said, well, in the British Army and the US Army, you would be, and you would be providing fire support and circling around that encampment and putting rounds down the range to, to support the guys as you're going in. So just like the Malaysian tactical, I think the, the tactical unit, I think they learned a few things as well from strike back on this is how you would do things. This is how you would go in. You know, I, I said to them, look, you know, some, some operations require, a, you know, potential sacrifice where a helicopter could bro get brought down, but you've got to protect your men. And, and so I, I had to make sure that everyone was confident that this is an operation that would take place. It's not something that's out of the, out of the norm. Um, but yeah, we, you know, once we got in, you know, we, we went through the drills and, you know, that we weren't allowed to take off so that no cast was allowed to be in the helicopter when it took off. So no one was actually flying in it other than I think one cameraman who was ex creation military. So they gave him dispensation to, to be in there when they flew outside, you know, when they, they took a film from out, you know, from inside looking outside. But literally the, the helicopter just sort of, the wheels just slightly took up and then went down. So you had that shudder. And then that's obviously when we started dispatching out of the uh, helicopter. I think that answered it. <laughs> <laughs> if any, if, yeah, I mean, it totally answered it. And I think it, it really paints the picture of how different what we see on screen is compared to what's really going on, you know, to know yeah. that, yeah, that never got more than a few inches off the ground is, kind of amazing there's only I one that you actually see two so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i just want to depart from strike back for just a second and maybe have you talk about the fact that hello you were the military tech advisor for the academy award-winning film this year <laughs> <laughs> what's that i don't know I, I'm not that <laughs> never heard of it what's that <laughs> Oh, yeah. I try not, just, try not just to talk the about short, but no. Hashtag <laughs> nineteen seventy eight. Sorry, did I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Thing is, everybody, everybody was asking me, oh, what's it like? What's it like? What's what the D kids like? What's it like? every time I got that, so then I was talking about it, and again Dell would be going, Oh no, not nineteen seventeen again. Shut up, will ya? And I'm like, who's not <laughs> who wasn't asking me? <laughs> had an amazing amazing couple of years i mean you know i mean for us like strike back would be the epitome of having a cool year but you've worked on so much can you just oh, yeah. tell us a little bit about what those last couple of years have been like for you mental um <laughs> hardly been at home um it, it's it has it was so exhausting because i'd be going from one job to the next like last year was just completely mental because I was going from 1917 so I started training the cast on 1917 in January and it was supposed to time out that everything all the military stuff would have been finished just as strike back started but then they had a problem with the the digging the trenches in Salisbury because of the the locals raised concerns that the, the soil might contaminate Stonehenge although it was about five miles away. So then that, that halted digging. So then that meant the filming had to, it was, it was going to cross over. So I was having this like, oh, no, how am I going to do this? And I, I got in touch with Nula and I said, look, you know, this is going to overspill. So I, I respect if you want to get another military advisor mm -hmm. um, to, to do strike back. And, and Nula was like, Nula uh, O'Leary was like, no, we want you. We, you know, we really want you. The, every, the cast want you. We'll make it work. And so then I got um, one of my guys, um, Spencer Collins, and I got him out to just keep an eye on things. So I, I, I basically came off from doing a, the boot camps in um, Salisbury for like 500 guys. And then what happened then, there was a seat, there was a couple of weeks where it, it was just stunts. It was when George just is on his own and he's going out into a river. And, and so there was two week, there was a two-week window there 
where I could basically leave the trenches. And I literally left the trenches, went home, had a shower, and a car was there to pick me up to take me to the airport to go to uh, Zagreb. Then I started the training for the cast, did all that, did some filming. Then my um, assistant Spencer came out. He kept an eye on things for two weeks. I went back to to do the battles, the, that big trench run and, and the night scene. That, then we wrapped. I had the wrap party and then got on a plane pissed and then came <laughs> straight back to Zagreb and then ca- cracked on. Then I finished strike back, got home. Had a day. I was I was recovering because it was my birthday um, <laughs> during the during the Rugby World Cup, and I was with a lot of my South African friends from the Army Department from Higher Arms, who um, who obviously rubbed it in that they won. And but it was my birthday, so <laughs> I got back. I was drunk on Sunday still, and then Monday I started a Guy Ritchie film. So I was just completely like, eh, "What's going on?" And I, I was so knackered by the end of it. But this. The last two years have just been mental, you know, really one after the other. So, And after it, once we wrapped on it all and I just sat back and I knew that I didn't have to do anything until the new year, I just sat back and I'm like, how did I get away with that? <laughs> you know, it sounds like by being drunk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I managed to smash it, smash it all. And um, yeah, here we are. Yeah, and then and then coronavirus. Yeah, but do you know what? I'm literally being paid to play a computer game now. So um, we're quite a, uh, called Sniper Elite, which is um, which is good. So yeah, <laughs> I'm just shooting people on <laughs> so on the teddy box. Yeah, that's not a, it's not a half bad job. I would definitely do that job. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, th- these things happen, and and um, and and as with everything, we will we'll all bounce back. Um, I'm not panicking. Um, I, I've got my gym, so I'm happy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did it come about that you were going to actually be in this episode? Back to Strike Back, as much as we love um, 1917. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, just originally, I wanted to be the hitman. That takes out the uncles. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, and I said, "Oh, that, that's got me written over." Because obviously, I get the scripts. <laughs> I get the scripts um, in advance, and then obviously, I, I go for it. And I was looking, I think, "Oh, I want to be the hitman." And then I was talking to um, the AD, one of the ads, Trevor Puckle, who's been on Strike Pack for for yonks. You know, he's he's old school, and he you know he's got a He's got a brain like a planet. He can remember everything. But he was like, yeah, I think I want a cameo role as well. And I went, you could be one of the uncles. I could shoot you in the face in the lift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was good. And, uh, <laughs> so it was It was, it was going to be like that. But, but then um, I was approached. Uh, I can't remember if it was Nulo or Jack, but he said, oh, look, we want you to be the soldier. We think it'd be really good that you're the soldier, the team leader of that, that squad. And I'm like, yeah, go on then. I'll do that instead. So yeah, that's that's what happened in the end. So I ended up being the the TAC team leader because that's the unit, the TAC unit. And then we I devised like the I uh, gave a design for a badge, and uh, the name of the unit, which is TAC, um, Tactical Advanced Company. And uh, yeah, just went from there really. But I was able to get you know full hands on stuff, how the kit, you know what they what kit they should be wearing. I was making the webbing. And I think there was a picture that went up on Instagram. It was my happy place, which was all the the, the, uh, the, the costume department yeah. where all the military weapons yeah. there. So I was, and like the Afghan scene where I was making the kit look airborne. So I was making all the guys because they're supposed to be from sexy and assault. Um, and I was just getting in amongst the kit, making all the kit look realistic, and um, you know putting zap numbers on them. As, as you probably noticed, my zap numbers on Mac. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, the five eight eight one, right? Say so again. It was five eight five eight eight one on his backpack. That's it. That's my your last four basically. You you have your last four on your on, on your on your pack on your on your on your body armor on your helmet, with your blood group um, and your and your name or your, your initial of your name. So it's it's called a zap number. So it's a way of identifying who it is. They can put it over the radio, man down B five double eight one, Opos. So that, that tells the medics right get. Get some, you know, get the, the right blood and everything else, so that you, you know, you can get get to the guy within the golden hour, or you know. So, um, so uh, yeah, that's that's all that them little Easter eggs I was able to put in, you know. So, so it was good. 
And a funny story about the Afghan scene as well, that when I was, when I was, because I sorted all the wagons out to make them look like, you know, sort of something near as damn it to Wimix that you use out there. Um, and I found ration packs, 24 hour ration packs in the bottom of the seat. Oh. And it was like, it was like, yes, I'm eating tonight. And so I had to rush <laughs> back uh, They were dated like 2014. But, <laughs> and, um, and it, it, was, it was not until afterwards, we was at the rap party and I was talking to one of the art guys about, I said, yeah, I found these ration packs. And Dell was like, yeah, he was eating crackers and, and tuna. That was 2014 and all oh. this. And then he went, they were props. I left them there as props. So I, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Damn, that is the props. <laughs> yeah, he left them there as props. He did, but I didn't realise. He didn't. No one said anything. So I thought, well, they were nice. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe feels like the most military thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm dying. That is brilliant. I love. Here. So part of the reason I love talking to you is I think we have this sort of conception of like military advisors like standing by the side and saying like don't do that don't do that here's how it goes and then you I mean, when we talk to you and if you guys haven't heard we talked to Paul about like an entire podcast about 1917 it's on the Nurks of the Hub podcast and how much you put into it how much effort and and detail and then you talk about this and you're making you know, Dan's ghillie suit and the wet webbing yourself. And it's just, there's, it's amazing, Paul. It really is incredible listening to you talk about the care that you take with it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's got your stamp on it. You know, you, you, you've got to take, there are, you know, there's military advisors out there that they do just bluff their case. They sit there, they, 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 they spend most of their time around craft. And then they'll go, oh, no, you wouldn't do it like this. You wouldn't do it like that. And, you know, and they're people that maybe do one job um, and then they don't get employed again because they become a pain in the backside. And, and the, you know, I, I've my job is to work with the team, the work with everybody and help them, help the costume and help the, you know, not get in their way and not just give problems, but actually give solutions. And, and I like to think that I give solutions to productions. And, and that's, you know, and, and there's things sometimes there's things I will see and I know it's like I'm gritting my teeth and I'm like, I really wouldn't do this, but can I suggest doing it this way to make it more credible? You know, because I know there's a lot of my mates that are going to be going, all right, Paul, what happened? You know, and I get it all the time. People try and rip me. Um, but you've got to have a thick skin in this job as well. But yeah, it, you do, it, you know, it's got your stamp on it. And, and it's like I've said, I've said to Dan, I've said to Warren, Erlin and, and B and, and Jamie, you know, and everybody else. It's like, you know, your success is my success. If you look good, I look good. And so it, I care. I want to make sure you look the best you can. I want to make sure you're carrying out your drills properly. I want to make sure that your kit is as realistic as I can get it. And all that sort of stuff, you know, that you're, you're, that all those little details, like the zap number, coming up the webbing, you know, spray painting the helmets to make them look a bit more realistic, not just sticking a helmet on, shaping the berries, making sure the berries look shaped and they look decent. So it was all those little belts and braces that some people don't notice, but like that film, what's it called? I can't remember now. Um, 1917, that's it. Um, <laughs> yeah, we heard just like that, you know, with George, you know, blowing dirt off his rounds before he sticks them in and not looking at his weapon when he, when he charges it. And so that, you know, it's, it's important. Okay, Sorry. You have to tell right now that we're crying. <laughs> what? success of the show and we might be we might be slightly still hung over uh on crying last night watching episode six again so uh again. <laughs> you're talking about the, your care for the show and oh jesus god damn it paul i actually told my husband this morning i was like paul's exactly what i need because i know he's not gonna make me cry <laughs> Uh, admittedly, when I was reading the script and I was uh, on on that ep, and I was like, "Oh, I, he's actually survived this." And then halfway halfway through reading it, and then I'm like, "Nah, oh no, I, I know." As soon as they said about see that guy, his eyes are flickering. That's him trying to find a way out. That's when I knew. I went, "Nah, this, I know what's happening here." <laughs> <laughs> I wish Even when I knew, I, knew, 
I thought they were going to pull something out of the bag right at the last minute and Jack was going to come in and say, right, we've had a change of mind. He's actually going to survive it. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping that myself, actually. So. Yeah, but as soon as you saw that, it was an arterial wound. Even in episode six, you knew it. There's just, you don't survive that. Yeah. But you could yeah. on strike back, yeah. damn it, Jack. <laughs> you got I did say that. Happens that, that, to be a vascular surgeon living in apartment three. <laughs> Well, I did say it would be it would be really funny that like, if right right at the very end and then it, it, it's like they have like you know after the credits and then there's Warren in the shower having a shower and then like what happened there just like Bobby Ewing. <laughs> like, <it's that> <laughs> <laughs> we all walked in. It was all a dream. Yeah, uh, but you never <sighs> never know. <laughs> okay, sorry, we're trying to, we're, we're collecting ourselves. All right, Paul, we need you to talk more. Tell us what was the hardest thing sequence that you had this season up to seven, up to episode seven. Hardest sequence after, oh, what, after seven? No, 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 up to ep seven. Oh, up to seven. Um, I think when I did the, I was, I was, I had my boy, um, Callum, with, uh, followed me and I, I actually sort of coordinated the run for Warren. Um, on his on his final, you know, his final <laughs> fight. To make to make a a yeah. <laughs> and I, I, no, it was. I mean, that was it was that, that was sex. That was because I was like, yeah, right. We, I remember because with John as well, it was so funny because we were talking through it, and I was running through the whole thing myself. Um, I've got a video of, of it where, where I'm running, saying, right, he's going to do this. He's going to come out here. Then he's going to hit this bit of cover. And then this guy's going to come out with an RPK. He's going to come down. He's going to take that. He's going to have his little Rambo moment with with a, a belt fed weapon. I remember when I said, I said he grabs that belt fed weapon and he starts putting it, putting rounds into the window. And John went, "Oh, you're being kinky now, aren't you?" And I went, "Yeah, but come on, let's do it. Yeah, come on, let's do it." And uh, the, the bit where he pulls out the pistol and just finishes that guy off while he's on the run. I'm so glad they got that in because that's all of it was just so. But it was exhausting because I was running it on my own um, and just going backwards and forwards and so that was my that was my leg day as well because it's going up and down <laughs> stairs and like god bloody hell, i'm 51 years of age and i'm running around like a lunatic still so <laughs> <laughs> but um no it was i enjoyed that bit but it was it was i mean the afghan bit was quite hard as well because um i mean we were, tra- we were right up in the hills yeah and again coordinating that you know and having the trying to get things as realistic as possible with the ground we had, it was pretty hard, you know, you know, saying, well, look, you know, we wanted to go, Jack wanted to do something near the Kajaki uh, Dam, and I'm like, well, there's nowhere like it on here. It wouldn't be realistic, but we could use a mountainous region where there is woodland, and, and it's very similar to, you know, uh, where the seals uh, were ambushed. We could use that as a fictitious area of operations for the Pathfinders. But one of the hardest things for me was getting past the, the creation um, people that do the badges, you know, they do the copyright stuff because they yeah. wanted to make these wings. Because you know, obviously we wear we wear wings and things like that. And um, they wanted to have these wings up and they gave this version of our British wings. And I'm like, no, no, we are not we can't wear this. Oh, no, no, we can wear this. No, 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 we cannot wear this. I'm not having these guys wear these wings. Yeah. Why not? I mean, because I've got to be able to walk in order shot and not get, you know, sort of, beaten up by half, half the regiment because right. I've just insulted the wings. You know, there's no way it's happening. I said, like, I'd rather walk off this show. No, like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I said, well, don't wear them wings. You're not having these wings on. Just have nothing. Just have their rank. That's it. Nothing more. So there was, I mean, nothing's really hard and in such as in everything. I've just enjoy it all. So you can't really, you can't really call anything hard that you enjoy, but challenging sometimes. I think that answers the question. God, I'm trying so hard not to make a bad joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> what about? What about? Go on. Well, well, about that there are some things that are hard that you can enjoy. Sorry. Oh. Well, um, yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> working out. <laughs> yeah, working out. That's, that's totally where my mind went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else you're thinking. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know. <clears throat> we'll move on. <clears throat> Yeah. You've spent two seasons working on this show. You've had, you know, we'd like to close everything out with the same, the same question that we got from Willip, from Willip, from Philip Winchester <laughs> about highs and lows of the season, because, you know, as he said, 
you're slogging through shit in rose colored glasses and you've had two seasons of rose colored glasses and a whole lot of everybody working together to try to pull this thing out. So you can give us your highs and lows for this season or for the whole experience, whatever you want, but give us some highs and give us some lows. Okay. Um, highs are finding those ration packs in, in the Land Rover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's You're nothing easily, like, easily pleased, man. <laughs> two, 2014 eat by a date for um, tuna oh, and God. biscuits AB. There's nothing like it in the world. Um, <laughs> and I've actually gone in the loft to get a load of rations out. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, that, that was a high. That was just, I just on my own, t- you know, just getting these wagons looking like Wimix and, you know, getting sorting where, where to put the mounts in. It's just when I found that, it was like winning the lottery. I'm like, oh, God. You know, if there was a camera watching, they'd think, what a weirdo. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, a lot, my, a lot of my highs are when I've seen, when I'm watching everything come together, you know, the whole team, everybody, every, everybody on you know, the cast crew, everyone just pulling together. And when you see that the, the, um, the return of it is, I mean, it's, I think I, I heard you say, I mean, the show doesn't get as much credit for the for the amount of work that that, that actually and, and the style of, of of the action and everything than, than it should do which is a shame really it really is uh, yeah. yeah a lot of my friends are like what's right back and admittedly even i was like it but when i when i took the job on i, I had to, I, I was given the whole box set i'd never watched it properly yeah you know, i'd never really paid my because it wasn't it's not advertised as much as it should yeah. be it's really, it's really uh-huh. not, and it's. I have the same problem here. I'm like, this is the show I love, and so many people are like, oh, I've never heard of it, and I'm like, God, it just drives me yeah. crazy because it's such a good show. I mean, they really do such a phenomenal job, and everybody works so hard. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, and it's like the one shot, and, and every all my mates, because I put it on, obviously on my on my page, and I show that one shot in, from last year. Yeah, and everyone's like. This is brilliant. This is one of the best action sequences I've seen in a long time, and they're comparing it to you know other similar action sequences, one shot scenes, and everyone's like, "This is really good." I've, I've never seen this show. Why are they not bloody advertising this? Yeah, and and, I know, and that's when I'm thinking, "Yeah, exactly." You know, like especially bloody you know some of these. Well, I can't say too much because they might be future employers once all this stuff comes <laughs> up. But our souls, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say, but no, um, but so that the, the, the one shot in Malaysia was was a high because that was brilliant, yeah. And the one shot with Warren is, is again is, is on par with that as well. It's sort of, yeah. So you know, so that they're my highs, lows. I haven't got any. It's really, I suppose, the low really was when we all parted in um, Croatia uh, on sort of we, we all we had the the rap party, but I can remember of it. Um, <laughs> Um, Warren sent me that picture of me laying on the floor completely <laughs> up. Um, but uh, yeah, it's sort of when we all we was all in the bar. We was watch we'd watched the the uh, England v uh, South Africa rugby game, and then we all started parting our ways, and it did feel really sort of like oh shit, shit this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I really enjoyed the show, and it's not because it's you know it's it's a uh, six months worth of work. It's just generally enjoying being with everybody and that that teamwork and everyone's having a laugh. Everyone's friendly. There's no bitching. There's no there's no nastiness. Everyone you know, obviously there's the odd bit of stress which people have, but other than that, it was one of the best crew and one of the best shows I've ever worked on. And I've worked on quite a few now, as you, as you probably know. But that show is just it's unique in in um, the people that that are all behind it and the people that are in front of it. And it's, it's, um, it's a shame, but never say never. You never know. That's what I say. You never know. We're not at X Phil. Stay with us at the crib. Episode six. Good Lord. That was some amazing television. Yeah. I I just think we, we were all just incredibly proud of that. We all, that block, you know, I mean, everything, Jack turned out these two episodes that were just unlike anything yeah. we've we'd seen before. You know, I think I'm not sure if we've had this conversation or not, but we all read them together yeah. at, around Warren's pool. 
and we're all crying and me, Warren and, and Elin. And then I sort of just text Warren the next day and said, Hey man, you, these are the episodes you deserve and, and you will win awards. You, you, your performance in this, I know will be worthy for you to, to win awards. You know, and sadly just strike back is, is, is such a niche show, such a niche show that, you know, on a, on a late night time slot on a, on a cable channel, it just doesn't get the eyeballs exactly. or the recognition. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's sad also just because the show has evolved so much from what it once was. And each year the show kind of reimagines itself or is reinvigorated. And when you get episodes like episodes five and six, which are just quite simply world international standard brilliant television you know and we that's not our that's not our that's not our benchmark well sorry that is our benchmark we don't we don't operate perhaps at that level on every episode because nor can you you can't you can't work at that emotional intensity you can't that's that's a payoff episode that's a spike episode because you have to go through all the seasons before to care about a character so much or care about these people so much that that when you they take you up to the top of the hill like they did and all of your departments are working together from script writing to director camera sound um costume design you, you see in episode six that, um the costumes are different they're brighter there's a slightly surreal otherworldliness to them because it's all from max point of view in max memory you know so when you get uh, makeup the makeup department trying to make warren look younger you know all that i mean when all the departments editing sound when everybody comes together to elevate already uh, exceptional material you get episodes like episodes five and six um not to underestimate the next four episodes because again i feel like that middle block of episodes five and six was the kick in the ass that the season needed to really start operating at a, at a higher level through the last four episodes. And I think the last four episodes are exceptional. I think they're incredible television. They, they revert to a more familiar strike back style of, of writing and construction and, and, and plotting and whatnot. And, but I think the execution of those episodes, particularly episodes seven and eight, against some very, very trying circumstances in the wake of Warren's departure, um, in the timing of, of, of everything, of, of scripts being produced, of how to get a helicopter uh, to do, you know, trying to work with the Croatian military when you're filming with helicopters and, and also just the aftermath of how much block three took out of people. I mean, they started block three shooting eight hours on the side of a mountain, as Warren told you, up in filming the Afghanistan flashback, you know, on the side of a mountain outside Zagreb in a ski resort in what was a heat wave in the middle of summer. I mean, this cast and crew were fucked, you know, and they had another three and a half weeks of that block in the middle block of the entire shoot. And I just must point out too that, and I don't know when this this chat is going to go to 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 uh, to air, but I'm just riffing now. But um, <laughs> Slierme, the ski resort just outside Zagreb, was one of the epicenters of the earthquake oh, that happened yeah. uh, just recently in Zagreb. Um, and so that's ten minutes drive from our home in the centre of Zagreb, where I lived, uh, just off the main street, Ilitsa. Warren lives just up the up the road. Um, you've seen the photos this yeah. week, um, so just mad big love and hugs to all of our amazing uh, crew and cast in Zagreb uh, and the city of Zagreb, which was our home for most of last year and the entire the home of the entirety of this of this season. But um, a lot of damage to to the old town and to to some of their yeah, oldest buildings and whatnot. It's a beautiful sound. They're, they're wonderful people. That was a wonderful home for us. And, uh, and just sending lots and lots of love in the wake of, of um, and the earthquake. So, yeah, yeah. there you go. Big love to uh, Hrvatska. Before we hop on to episode seven, I just want to say what you were saying about five and six. So, I mean, it's just, you're right. And that's one of the things that we've talked about before on here is it really, it's, I find it 
extremely aggravating that strike back it won't get the attention the 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 one shot last year should have been everywhere uh you know talked about as as one of the most incredible action yeah. shots you'll ever see six should absolutely you know be nominated and and it, it just won't get the attention that it should unfortunately it's very mm-hmm. aggravating but my, I don't know if you know this. I know Jack, I, I've talked to you about it. My husband does not watch Strike Back. It's like this weird, right. like, stubborn marriage thing that, like, and, you know, he's in the military, so he just doesn't like to watch any kind of military shit. Yeah. I feel like you're either, it, yeah. people in the military either love that or, like, hate it. There's no middle ground. He just won't yeah. watch it. So Yeah. I want to come home and watch golf, not more military. Yeah. yeah. So I made him yeah. sit down yeah. and watch five and six because I was like, you just, he's like, I don't like military shows. I was like, but you don't watch it for that. Just trust me, you have to watch that. And I looked over, and about halfway through six, he starts crying. And he doesn't know you guys. He doesn't know, like, he does, he's not, he doesn't know the characters. He doesn't, you know, give a shit. But all of, he's crying, and he cries the whole second half of six. And, then, and when it was over, uh, he goes, that was the best character death I've ever seen. And I was like, I fucking told wow. you! <laughs> you know, wow. so just those two episodes... <laughs> You know, he was like, my God, like, you know, when the team is coming in, I was like, I know, I know. And they're like trying to get to him <laughs> and he can hear them. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. yeah. You know, so. Oh, man. Well, that's great. I mean, like, I, there, there, might be a, there might be a push to get people just to watch five and six and maybe then they'll discover the show and, and head back and watch earlier seasons and, yeah. and whatnot. I mean, it's a bit like the Titanic knowing what happens at the end and working towards it. But I think you'd still enjoy <laughs> seasons past but um you know even as a standalone episode mm-hmm. or a standalone two episodes it's, it's really worth watching and so if you're in quarantine and you're at a loss and you want to discover something new uh check out episodes five and six of probably not with this you last podcast, finale okay. season of strike back <laughs> but we've probably just given it all away <laughs> all right so let's uh yeah let's talk about episode seven that we you know actually just saw you in uh, mm-hmm. which is amazing. I will tell you my, the, the moment that lingers with me, it like makes me like my spine tingle even now is Wyatt to Noven. I apologize for my miscommunication, Lance Corporal. And I told Deb during our review, it literally like the hairs on my neck, the back of my neck stood up and like, Oh, so intense. So can you, I guess, just start off by talking a little bit about Going from your team of three and then Warren being gone and what it was like going into this and feeding that sort of like grief um, and rage and and whatever. It's funny, I, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to go deeper and darker and further and I wanted Wyatt to be out in that sniper position for days. I wanted to him, him to go on and shaved half his head off and, and like gone full animal, you know, like, like fuck it, I'm going to get these guys. From a place, of, from a place of grief, from a place of loss, from a place of um, doing Mac, his brother, proud, from talking to soldiers that had done the same thing, to the research that I'd done, going, and um, so I went into Sean and so hey, I think I think well, these ideas, you know, I'm going to be up there. I've been out, I've been out I do an Overwatch in this military camp where we, the next thing is, and I've been out there for a couple of days and I'm covered in dirt and this and. Here's this guy's haircut that I've seen. You know, this this guy when he was in Afghanistan and kind of shaved the sides of it. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. But um, the powers that be came back and said, oh, I don't think Wyatt's had time for a haircut. It's like, oh, <laughs> pretty, pretty sure Wyatt's got a set of clippers in his bag. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take that long. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Uh. So I was like, I immediately kind of knew that we're all on on different on different visions of of where we were and, and, and that's fine. I understood that, but I, I wanted, I had, I wanted to go further, but you know, in hindsight now, I, I said the vision was very much following Noven and following Noven's grief. Um, perhaps more so, um, over those next couple of episodes and, and, uh, and, and Aline does a wonderful job throughout the, the, the run to the end. That moment that you're talking about was, I kind of thought why it was going to be a grenade. Like he would just comp- keep it down, keep it down, keep it down. Uh, even when he chases the kid that looks like Zayef, doesn't tell anyone where he goes, goes and does it himself. He's trying to he's trying to deal with him by himself. So instead of being a team guy, he's, he's been a, a loner again. Uh, and that's how he operates, and that's his safe space. That moment 
where I kind of explode and turn around and stand up to a limb. Uh, Alin didn't know I was going to do that, um, but it was something I kind of thought about because I there's a time now he's just been shot. He's just, he's furious, and never have you seen Wyatt assert his physicality over over Novin. So on the first take when I did it, uh, the first rehearsal, I started laughing. She kind of was like, like, what? And kind of had this, this laughing response. And and then, you know, we only got to do it once. It's once or twice. But um, the take that's in there, uh, you know, I mean, I was, I, I don't know if they cut it out, but there was, I did, did it twice, but there was one where there was like, this tear running down through the dirt, just trying not to just fucking hold it, just fucking hold it. And then the take they used was, was a Lynn fighting back. And again, it's all that un, unspoken, the unspoken stuff that that is hidden behind the the tension, and these people trying really hard to remain in control of their emotions, in control of their their mission, um, and, and in control of themselves, and the battle between being soldiers and being human humans, in a sense. You know, um, and please don't take that the wrong way. But there is an expectation of how you should behave when you're when you're at work on mission, moving forward. And that's in the middle of the battleground. Is not the time for that. But so oh, I love that moment. I, I, I was really proud of it. I was really proud of having an idea, taking it to set, and your other actor, the other actor, taking it on board and. And, um, and and reacting to it and and it felt like a a little bit of a spontaneous electric moment and I don't think anyone I, I, it was it wasn't in a script you know it was like I can get right up to see Wyatt stand up and get right up in her yeah. face was was um, really uncharacteristic and hopefully it, it showed that just how how um, how far these guys have been stretched yeah well, I mean it was definitely it was different because we haven't seen that cold rage come from him and that's sort of what it turned it, yeah it was well like I said I mean it felt like like that like where your whole body just goes oh, you know from from mm -hmm. the way he yeah like your upper body does that thing that guys do when they're yeah. like you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I, I kind of I, like I said I, I just uh there was I mean I mean it, I I spent three years with, with, with Warren as my best mate traveling around the world, going through everything on and off screen. I didn't have to act very hard um, when it came to losing him or, or, you know, even in the finale scene in episode six was like, uh, I just prepped and prepped and prepped. And we prepped, as we said, for, for a week for that moment. And John Jones was like, I'll just roll the camera. And that, you know, that first take was the one where it was all, all the tears and all the screaming and all the ad lib, which again, that scene wasn't, wasn't, um, scripted as such but you know don't you fucking leave me was one of the most sort of powerful ad libs that we came up with on the day and it was like you know it was it was all in there so so again when you have to it's far more interesting to don't cry it's far more interesting to to watch these guys try and contain their emotions than it is to let them out i reckon and and that's something again i've noticed in the edit over the years is those editing the show don't like seeing the, the big man cry, you know, and, and I'm, I, I'll drop a tear. I'll drop a tear whenever I can, you know, <laughs> I really will. But uh, very few of them make it to screen. <laughs> That's what Warren said too about his, that thing in the therapist was that there was like a one where he cried and they didn't use it. He wasn't very happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. sure. I think, I think like at the end of the day, like they, you know, the, the, the general decision is that it's just more interesting to watch people try and fight, fight it than, and let it come out, and I understand that. But, you know, big men don't cry, but they do. They do. They, do. they just don't make the cut. <laughs> you like it when they fight it, fight it, fight it, and then lose. Oh. Right? Yes. Right. So much better. Yeah. But Warren, you said, Warren said the, the hardest thing about, about his death scene, where he's got the bleeding out from the jugular, and he's looking at us, and he's looking up. And I, you know, I, I don't know, did he say it? But he was like, the worst thing was like, I was trying to keep his eyes open while all our tears were going into his face. <laughs> he did say it. You fucking pricks. You get up at you fucking pricks with your fucking tears coming with your fucking eyes. <laughs> yes, mate, I love you too. <laughs> he did say it. Yes, we laughed a lot. Uh, yeah. So anyway, it's been an emotional, 
emotional ride. But episode seven, I, I loved seeing the, the team kind of go back to work. And there's a, there's a newfound ferocity to the way this, this team works now, you know. And um, there's a little extra spring in their step. There's a little extra sharpness to the blade of this team, I reckon. There also seems to be a little bit of a more comfort with Coltrane. The scene in the in the van as you're hanging over the <laughs> on the edge, mm. staring death in the face. My sense was that Novin and and Wyatt seem a little more comfortable with him now. Like there's almost sort of like, well, we're, there's really nothing, not much left to lose here. We just lost our best friend, so maybe we need to start. Yeah, getting I, think more a, real. I think it's a really good. I think that's a good take on it. You know, I don't think ever. I don't think we've ever really properly explored how Coltrane and Wyatt feel about each other, um, as him coming in, taking over a position of command. Uh, as an Englishman, uh, Wyatt as an American, we've never explored what they really think of each other. Uh, Jamie and I have, you know, obviously just, just fucking Wyatt to kill Zarkova. Oh, yeah. well, exactly. And you throw in, you throw in the kill order on Zarkova. You throw in the fact that he thinks Mac should go to officer training. That you know, last year he wanted uh, Novin to go and go and be an officer. Like, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff to unpack there. I mean, they. You know, I think it just gets to a point of fuck it, yeah. you know, and we see we see this relationship become more fraught in episodes to come, like way more fraught in episodes to come. So <laughs> wait, when's the? Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Except, yeah. Hang on, just get my episode numbers. Is that it? Nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In yeah. The safe house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get to that. Th- three seasons and, and, and done, which is sad. We're always going to hold out for Very more. Enough. But what, what felt different this year? Because you guys, I mean, you guys already stepped it up so much last year. But this year, it, it, God, it's good. It's real good. Uh, and I know there were some, you know, there's obviously always stuff you have to get through. But, I mean, what, what, did, you, yeah. what did you feel like? Um, the- you know, I think... Uh, it was hard. We had a lot of we had a lot of new crew, you know, and a lot of new people to strike back. A lot of um, strike back stalwarts had been taken off to to do another show for Left Bank, so we had a lot of fresh faces. A lot of people who were really um, discovering what the show was for for the first time. You know, in production, everything from production to creative and whatnot. And we were discovering, as we do, we were discovering a new country. First and foremost, I fell in love with Croatia, and I think it took until block three, episodes five and six, to Croatia to really uh, reveal itself to us, you know? And, like, we were first block, it was, like, cold and wet. And, like, hang on, we were in Malaysia in the tropics <laughs> having weekends in Singapore last year. <laughs> now we're in our hotel in Zagreb. And, and there was just a lot of teething problems getting the production going, you know, um, over there in, in, a, in a new in a new setup, you know, and with a whole bunch of new faces, that happens on every job. But after the highlights of Malaysia and the season before, and the just how if you go back to our first season, um, and again that's season six or seven, depending on where you are in the world, it was such a learning experience for everybody, not only in front of the camera, behind the camera as well. No one knew what strike back was going to be that year. No one, it, it, there were so many views and visions of how they were going to reboot Strike Back, what it was going to look like. It was going to be a team of four. They were using Fast, as, Fast and the Furious as a, as a reference point, which is you know, very different to Scott and Stonebridge days. So when we kind of saw what that season looked like on air, because even by the time it was in the can, even by the time we wrapped that season, no one knew what it was until it was edited, post-produced and sent out to air. And when we saw it, we sat down and watched it Oh, fuck, okay, great. That's what the show is. So then we were able then to go and execute it. Everyone was on the same page, and we're going to execute it in Malaysia last year. Yeah. Then you kind of think you know what you're doing, and the ground kind of gets ripped out from under you in a way. And, look, we were really lucky, you know, to, to get a third season. You know, that was a, that was, there was a lot of pieces had to really fall into place for us to, to go again, and we did. And, and it was like, great, we, we knew what we were doing. And we weren't really privy to that. Of course not. We're cast. We're actors. We're the lead cast, and you get the green light or you get the red light. We got the green light. Great. We're going again, and um, off we go again. But also too, like 
Malaysia took so much out of us. And so there was a, a lot of Malaysia fatigue by the time we'd even got to Croatia. We were up in Malaysia in October and Jack and Nola and everybody was straight into writing scripts, straight into wrecking for the next year. And suddenly we're in pre-production in you know, February, March and we start shooting in April. You know, I mean, that's that's a tight turnaround for 10 episodes that have just moved across the, the, the globe. What was different this year? We we knew we knew we knew what we were doing, I guess, more so. But the third season, we, we as a lead cast and by lead cast, I, I also, you know, I mean, Jamie, I mean, look at the difference in mm-hmm. Colonel Coltrane from one season to the next. Mm-hmm. And that incremental leap is the same as the incremental leap that I think Warren, Alina, and myself made after our first mm-hmm. and second seasons. Verada, um, just who would have thought that Chetri was capable of what she did this yeah. season throughout the course of this season? Um, performance in the field, her action, her, everything she did. And I'm so proud of her. This final, final episodes, oh my God, stunning. It was interesting. I had a chat. I had a chat to Bill Shepard, who was a long-time um, series line producer and one of the shows. But we had, I think, this year. I guess it was a dynamic of knowing. We had a lot of people coming back, knowing what they did, and we had a lot of people coming to the show new. And so through some of those challenging times, you got Paul Wilmshurst setting up the series. You got Bill Eagles, solid as a rock, doing block two. But then we had John Jones and Michael Wood, who are first-time Strike Back directors, first-time DP, and they had, uh, I'm pretty sure from memory they had, did they have Simon Noon? Who was their first AD? They had a returning first AD. But you've got a new DP, new director, first-time Strike Back, so they rely on people like Steve Murray and, on camera to sort of hold their hand through that. They had great scripts to work with, and they had Warren Brown in the driving seat throughout those two, two blocks. But to then... We've never done this before to then go to a block of seven and eight, where again, we have a first time strike back director in the incredible John Strickland, who just done the bodyguard and done everything around the world and, but a stunning director, but also then another first time strike back DP, a first time strike back first AD, first time heads of department across the board and scripts that were still running late because block six was so monumental. Then then you've got a backlog of we've, – we've never gone – we've never had two consecutive non-strike-back directors mm. before, if that makes sense. You'd have yeah, a, a yeah, new guy, yeah. and you go back to an old uh, – an experienced yeah. director. And and that's the type of show. Was, so we did that not only with director, but DPs, yeah. first yeah. ADs. Wow. So, so, so that's nine weeks of stepping on the set every day with people who have not done the show before. And that was a really challenging time, not only because the, not only, not only would that have been challenging if it was just normal strike back, but it was strike back in the final season in episodes five and six, which was a, two stellar episodes on the page, but also monumentally huge because of what they contained. Then into seven and eight, which were, highly charged because of the emotional state of your of your lead characters and your lead cast also the exhaustion buttons kicking in mm-hmm. because I, not only it's always exhausting for block four but because your block three was so monumentally big and exhausting and you find helicopters and blowing shit up and and and, and whatnot so what it meant was though that it really you were you were in that fucking place where it was it was hard and it was hot and you're exhausted and you had to stand up and and lead we had to stand up and lead as lead cast because right. we were the only ones that had been there for 30 episodes in a row i i don't know i just felt that there were particularly in those in the second half of this series there was a real maturity of performance from all of us and I, and i think maybe that had something to do with it that 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 um that w- suddenly we were the most experienced people on set and that maybe hadn't happened before, you know, because the Wilmshursts and the Bill Eagles had done multiple, multiple series before. Um, and, I take, and I say that with the exception of someone like Steve Murray, who'd been doing it mm-hmm. for, for a very, very long time, the eyes of Strike Back, and a few others, you know, that have been that have been there. But um, for the most part, we were as there. We'd been there longer than all the producers 
or as long as if not longer than all the producers as long as the series producer yeah, I guess it meant you, you kind of step a look at it. so it was challenging it was challenging. I mean, I mean I'm talking I'm talking sort of back shop stuff I'm talking behind the scenes kind of politics -y kind of stuff but it affects what happens on screen and what I will say and I may be talking out of school there I just was on a, on a riff but those challenges forced us to work harder, work better, work better as a cast, work together as a cast. And also, we knew that this was our last shot. This was our final season. We owed it to everybody that watched the show, everybody that had been a fan of the show, to the legacy that Andrew Lincoln and Scott and Stonebridge and Shelley Lukes and Robson Green and all these wonderful people and wonderful names that had gone be before us had set up and entrusted us with. And then we owed it to ourselves to, to um, overcome all the kind of challenges and deliver something exceptional in the, in the final season. And, and I, I think from episode five onwards, this, this is an exceptional season of television and and I hope that, that people see it. And I hope that people watch it. And I and I leave very proud of everybody involved. I leave very proud of of my fellow castmates, who just are exceptional, and and all the creatives and all the people that that have been involved with it. You know, and it's it's a ride like no other. I mean, you see guys like Michael Wood, DP, who's on you know, on Instagram and Twitter, and how much he loves his life. And it's amazing because you get you know, get these wonderful creators and they come in and they, they're there for six or seven weeks, and a couple of weeks of pre and four or five weeks of shoot, and they leave the day after the block finishes and they go back to their real life and get fuck, strike back's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, shit, you're doing that. We're doing that five times a year for seven months. It's monumental, man. It's, it has a monumental effect on you for three years straight. So, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, and we're all still processing what that means to us. Um, it's wonderful to get the feedback when it finally goes to air, but there's a lot of processing going on. I mean, you know, for the second year in a row, Warren Brown jumped on a flight to Australia straight after he got home to England for about two weeks and went, "Foot that lad," and off he <laughs> off he comes, mate. You know, <laughs> so so uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting time. It's always hard post strike back, and. Uh, and, and thankfully, you know, I, I had, I got, a, I got another job, at, actually at the Stripe Back Rap Party, which is, um, which was a, a, yeah, a blessing and a curse, but it also sort of pulled me straight out of, allowed me to focus on something. I had, I had three months off, and um, and it was able to come home to Sydney and and really just have some amazing family time and personal time, and recovery time, but also knowing that I had a job to go back to this year. And, and I'm sure we'll do a podcast about that job at some point <laughs> when the hiatus is over. Yeah. When any of us ever go back to work. Uh, oh yes, we uh, will. Yeah. So so wait, I, I was I just popped home to see the family for for like a week or two from Ireland so I've been on this other, <laughs> other job, and it looks like I'm going to be here for yeah. like a couple of months. So yeah. Um, uh, uh, which I'm not complaining about. Which is which at least is you got stuck wonderful. there and not in Ireland, right? Well, I was supposed to fly back last monday and then uh and then and oh, then that and then they, they cancelled like the right so that would have been the worst it would have been the worst but um so no no it's, it, I'm, I'm definitely uh quarantined in the right place and, and like i said just spending some family time and some time back in sydney with with um with everybody is, is really nice even though we're still facetiming and social isolating and distancing but i'm um, doing all the right things washing lots of hands yeah but um <laughs> but uh look forward to telling you all about the new gig when i when i can because uh, i think everything's shut even even the press releases have shut down but um but that's a cool one that's a cool one. So yeah, that that just allowed me to really just put my focus forward to something else rather than doing what I've done in previous years, which was wallow in post strike back come down for a couple of months. Yeah. Which is yeah, you know, nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. Because, <laughs> you know, everyone's everyone's doing it. Everyone does it. That that and I'm a workaholic. Because I don't know what to ask you after that. That was yeah. You answered all my questions and more, and you know. Not much more we can ask except the standard Philip Winchester rap question. 
Knowing that, as you just explained, it is one big, long, grueling adventure, and you're slogging through shit together in rose-colored glasses, give us your highs and your lows. Oh, man. I mean, you can't get to this end, this, this, this end kind of episode, this as we kind of careering towards the end of end of strike back as we know it, I kind of have to look back and look at the season, but I have to, have to look back at the job as, as a whole. And, you know, from, from the audition process back in, in London, you know, I mean, the, the, the kind of heavens kind of had to open up and the stars had to align even for me to be able to attend the audition, you know, like I was working on um, APB in Chicago and the audition chemistry reads were in London and they're on a certain dates and I was filming. And then actually as the, as the audition process went on, I was like on a short list and then I was off the short list because I was too much like Sullivan Stapleton. And I don't know if I ever told you that, but, no. but I got taken <laughs> off the short, I got taken off the short list because perhaps we were too similar. Um, That's so funny. I don't know if anyone's okay. ever met really? or me or seen us together. We had lunch last week. I'll tell you about that in a second, but, <laughs> But uh, maybe there was just, you know, maybe it's the Australianness or the facial hair, or it was, wasn't certainly it wasn't the fact he's a foot tall. Um, but but maybe there's a little an Australian essence in there that um, may have been a little bit too similar. So I was off, I was off the list. I was like, wow. strike back. You, you're going really behind this list. You're on this short list. You're on the list. Oh, okay, okay, cool. You're back on the list. You got to fly to London <laughs> next week. Well, hang on, I can't go to London next week because I'm filming in Chicago. Uh, well, then you haven't got the Chicago dates changed and I could go and then the London dates changed and like the exact six days off I had in Chicago were the exact four days of, of the chemistry test in LA, in London, sorry. Wow. So I went Chicago, LA, LA, London, London, LA, LA, Chicago. And I fit it in and I did it. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. But I met Warren Brown and I met Alyssa Mawata and I auditioned with a couple of other Australians that I know very, very well. Um, who are wonderful people. Um, Roxanne McKee, uh, who we met for the very first time there, um, and a whole bunch of other people. And that began the wild ride that was strike back. And pretty soon we were in the desert in Jordan and we were all hanging out the side of a Black Hawk helicopter, um, <laughs> flying around the Dead Sea. And that was that was nuts. And you could talk about Budapest and we've talked about Malaysia and we've talked about last season. But highlights of this year. Being able to go for it 110% with every ounce of energy and emotion you have um, while paying respects or giving Warren Brown and Thomas McAllister the send-off they deserve in episode, episode six and sitting out in our gym gear at the bar underneath my house, drinking double gin and tonics while learning lines with Warren Brown for episodes five and six in the Croatian summer nights uh, was pretty epic. Uh, Boris and Vera, who run the bar underneath my apartment, <laughs> sending them lots of love. Driving to these epic, epic locations all around Croatia. Again, I fell in love with that country, and that was just... That was just such a sublime backdrop and the people there and our crew. I just cannot, I cannot speak highly enough of our Croatian and Slovenian crew. They welcomed us with such open arms and the experience that they gave us, the hospitality that they showed us and, and what they did to go above and beyond to create this final season. Um, I'll be forever grateful for, um, and then, look, I, I can't go past this moment in the second last week of Strike Bait that comes up in the final episode. We're in, an, we're in a national park in the middle of nowhere, speeding up a river in a speedboat, being chased by a helicopter that is firing missiles at us, being chased by another boat that is firing guns at us which is being chased by another helicopter, which has a, has a camera team in it. Jamie Bamber's driving the boat. <laughs> the armourers have thrown a Lynn and I a bag full of loaded magazines and have just gone, look, guys, <laughs> sorry, we can't get on the boat with you. <laughs> Off you go. It's about 28 degrees. The sun is shining. It is the most spectacular part of the world. 
and we're filming this badass action show where they blow up explosions left and right and helicopters weaving behind us and I get to play an action hero and <laughs> it was it's it's like uh far out it's just it's been an incredible ride and that was an incredible finale we then went and spent the final week underground in the most hideous location <laughs> in an abandoned hospital pissing down rain and snowing in zagreb um which we'll forget about altogether because that was just like a grind to the end so i'm going to re- remember my final kind of Cro- uh, croatian strike back moments of in this boat in this river in this ravine and i think that afternoon too um coltrane and i got to go ride horses along cliff top in the most spectacular backdrop um so highs and lows you know that there's just too many highs uh the lows the lows are saying goodbye to uh thomas McAllister, and just that maybe it took us so long to to get this season up and running at, at max capacity but you know look jack jack writes jack writes himself into a season he always does he starts gets all the pieces he spreads them all out and then slowly cranks it tighter 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 until about you know two-thirds of the way through the season things are really really tight and you, you scream towards the end and this season was no different you know and we had you know a lot of new faces on set and that was wonderful and there was a fresh energy to get us through to the end um and and we did it and we made it and I leave satisfied and having just watched the final four episodes only last week. I keep using this word maturity, but a real maturity of performance towards the end, you know, that, that didn't exist when we started um, back in Jordan three years ago. Proud of the journey and I'm proud of the way we've all grown and the way we've all embraced it and the fact that we were fighting to the bitter, bitter, bitter end to make this show as good as it possibly could be. Um, whereas... You know, I've been on shows or I know of shows where people know it's the end, it's the last one, and they go, well, screw it. We don't have to, you know, we can phone it in and, you know, be drunk on an island on the weekends, which we did as well. But we made sure that we were turned up on Monday, mostly, except there was just one Monday. Oh, my God, we nearly got our asses kicked. But uh, most days we turn up and, um, you know, fight till the bitter end to make this show as, as good as it could be until the final take on the final day. I hope you all like it. Thanks, and tune in next week for another Need to Know session at the Crib. Follow us on Twitter at Strike Back Crib. Out.